Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you all know who I am, and you're not here to hear me talk, so I'm going to make it as quick as I can. Um, we are joined today by Ed Tome and Angie Biden Sayak, the executive co executive directors of the Linwood Hall Preservation Foundation. Um, I've had the fortunate opportunity to work with Linwood Hall for the last five years, I believe. Uh, it has been an adventure working uh, with some of the people that are involved or were involved with Linwood Hall. Um, and there were some questions in the past about whether uh, the building could be saved or not. Um, and the reason why Ed and Angie are here today is that it looks like a corner has been turned and a very uh, significant piece of American architectural history uh, will be saved. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Ed uh, to give you a little history of the building and to talk about where they are going from here. So, Ed. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Um, Dr. Stephen Hartley has been an integral part of our advisory team for six years now, and we rely on him heavily for advice every week. So we are very, very thankful for him and for the opportunity to be able to come here and speak to you all today. So in talking about Linwood Hall, um, we're going to do a overview of the history, uh, and then we'll talk about you know, the next steps, our background, what the future is for the house. So let's start at the very beginning with the gentleman who had Linwood Hall built in the first place. And let's look at his background. So this is Peter A.B. Widener. Um, he was born in West Philadelphia in 1834. His father was a bricklayer. Um, you know, they had very regular means. They didn't come from money. And he had no higher education outside of high school, um, though he was noted to be a math whiz in high school. Um, he started his own butcher business right, out of high, right outside of high school, and that subsequently turned into several butcher businesses, which was kind of his first foundation uh, building businesses. Um, his stall happened to be close to City Hall, and due to that proximity, he got to know a lot of the local politicians at that time. And because of those connections, he was actually awarded a, a contract uh, in the early days of the Civil War to supply mutton to the Union troops within a 10 mile radius of Philadelphia, which netted him $60,000, which in today's money is about 800,000, give or take. Um, <clears throat> because of this, he went on to become the treasurer for the city of Philadelphia, also a very lucrative position. Uh, and after several years of doing that, he sat down with his best friend, William Elkins, and they decided they wanted to pool their money and to go into business together. And what were they going to do? Traction. So the city, the cities were ever growing at this time, and it was becoming harder and harder to walk from one end of the city to the other. So they saw traction as their big opportunity to build a business. And they originally started with horse drawn and trolley cars, and then they went on to uh, electrified ones later down the road. And they initially started this business with friends William Kemble from Philadelphia and Charles Yerkes of Chicago. And this was their kind of bread and butter for about 30 years of their business. But he didn't really stop with his um, investments there. Uh, by the 1880s, uh, his eldest son, George Dunton Widener, was really kind of running the business, family business neck and neck with him. And they decided to diversify their money and invest in other uh, major companies as well. So a couple of the ones that you see up on the screen, U.S. Steel, they co-founded American Tobacco. They were involved with Baltimore, Ohio Railroad, Pennsylvania Railroad. And perhaps their biggest investment was IMM, known as the International Mercantile Marine Company, which was owned by J.P. Morgan. Uh, IMM basically owned all of the major shipping lines and uh, passenger transportation lines globally. Um, so that was a really, really big deal and a major investment for them. And IMM actually owned White Star Line. So you will often hear, or if you, if you look up Linwood Hall online, you'll see, oh, you know, Titanic Owner's Mansion, Peter Widener owned the Titanic. He didn't directly own the Titanic, but he was a major investor in a company that owned White Star Line and therefore the RMS Titanic. So with all this money, everybody wants to know, how did he spend it? So his first major residence was on North Broad Street in Philadelphia, and he built this fantastic brownstone home uh, by Willis G, designed by Willis G. Hale, 
who was one of the preeminent architects at that time in Philadelphia. North Broad Street today is kind of derelict and not the best place to be. But unfortunately, uh, I hate to tell you that a KFC now occupies the spot of this house. Uh, <laughs> but um, this was at the time the largest private residence in Philadelphia. And it's kind of funny because all the nouveau riche, if you will, the new, uh, newly wealthy built their homes on North Broad Street because they weren't welcome south of Walnut Street, which is where all the old money lived in Rittenhouse Square and Society Hill and all that. Now, society would come up and view this house and gawk at it and partake in Peter's good hospitality, but they rarely ever uh, ex uh, gave that hospitality back to him, which is interesting. So back in these days, it was very fashionable for people of this uh, magnitude and wealth to have countryside residences and summer homes. And part of this was to be ostentatious and part of it was also to be practical where health is concerned. The cities were very dirty back in those days and it was just smart to have a country residence if you could afford one to capitalize on the fresh air. So here's a wonderful picture of a map of Ogons Park, which is now known as Elkins Park today. And this was being widely marketed by developers in the mid to late 1880s uh, as they had planned to densely populate this area of little country residences. And that kind of backfired on them because all of the nouveau riche captains of industry at that time, like Widener, Elkins, Wanamaker, Stetson, Breyer, etc., they just bought everything up. And they turned everything into these massive estates, uh, some of which were exceeding 300 acres. Um, so Ogons Park kind of became the new fancy suburb of Philadelphia where all these great, great mansions were built. And unfortunately, Linwood and a handful of others are the only ones that survive today. <clears throat> in the next slide, we see in this rendering, Linwood Hall and the Lodge, which is interesting because Linwood Hall had not yet been constructed. But obviously, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about this. And this was, you know, supposed to be a great feature of the community. Um, in the left circle, you can see the rendering for Linwood Hall. In the middle circle, you can see the original Linwood Hall. And in the top right, you can see the renderings for what would later be uh, the carriage house. This is the house as Peter bought it. So we're not really sure what year this was constructed or who constructed it, but we do know it was a private summer residence and then it was a girls' school. And as you can see, Peter, you know, greatly expanded and remodeled it on the, on the right. And this was the late 1880s, early uh, 1890s. And he had Angus S. Wade do all the alterations to this building, which is kind of funny because the building didn't survive another 10 years before it would be leveled to make way for the new Linwood Hall. <clears throat> so this is where Horace Trumbauer comes into play. Um, Peter's wife, uh, Hannah Josephine Widener, passed away in 1896, and Peter wanted to construct a home that was large enough for his two sons, their families, um, and their staff to live in. And everybody in the family was a collector of something, whether it was books or fine art, decorative art, china, porcelains, you know, you name it, they collected it. So he wanted to keep his family together uh, so he wouldn't be alone for the rest of his life. So he hired Horace Trumbauer in 1897 to design for him a massive house that could accommodate everything that he wanted to accommodate. And Trumbauer was just 90 or 27 years old when he designed Linwood Hall. And Trumbauer is an interesting story too, because he was another man who started from humble beginnings as well. I mean, he was also born in West Philadelphia. He had no formal education. Uh, you know, he went on to design some of the greatest American palaces, if you will, of that era, and he never left the United States. He had not once ever traveled to Europe, which is kind of interesting. So Peter and Horace were connected through uh, one of the Widener's good friends, William Harrison. And Harrison had hired Trumbauer to build for him a literal castle in Glenside just down the road, which is still there today, called Gray Towers. And Peter was impressed with this enough to give this guy a chance to build him the new Linwood Hall. And what he ended up creating is one of the finest residential buildings in America to this day. Um, and it's still the largest house in Pennsylvania. Many consider White Marsh Hall, the long lost sister mansion of Linwood Hall, which was demolished in 1980, Horace's greatest work. 
But with a little bit of bias, I think this is his most um, significant work because this house is really what made his career. This is what really put him on the map. So here we see this wonderful picture of Linwood very shortly after construction was completed in 1900. And uh, Peter's grandson, P.A.B. II, dubbed it the house that Art built, and it truly did. Um, it's just an absolutely incredible property. You can see the sunken Italian eight gardens out front. Uh, just one of the most fantastic residences Philadelphia had ever seen. This is a really interesting schematic. So we I just mentioned White Marsh Hall, and that's the um, facade of White Marsh on the top, which while it was a larger residence than Linwood, it wasn't quite as wide. And you have Linwood in the middle, which purportedly has the longest res residential enfilade in the North America region. And just for fun, we stuck the White House down below. So you can really see the scale difference between these three different buildings. This is a picture of the first floor uh, floor plan for the house. So this gives you an idea of just how many rooms are in this house uh, and this very strange shape of the house too. I mean, it's a very unique design. It's kind of like an upside down T. Um, it, it's just it's very unique design. Uh, and there's really no other house in the country that looks anything like this. Um, the back portion of the house, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is up here, that was added on in 1908, 1909. So that was not originally there. So this is a colorized version of the picture that you just saw a couple slides ago of the Italianate sunken gardens. Now these eventually were filled in uh, to put in a more French and more modern gardens, which we'll see later down the road. But these were designed by the Widener's head gardener, William Kleinheitz, who was actually with the Widener family from 1900 to 1943, when the last Widener uh, lived at Linwood Hall. The interiors were <laughs> said to be by the grandson, the last word in Victorian elegance. So the Victorian era was just really kind of sliding out by the time this home was built, but everything was high Victorian. Uh, and you had major companies like Jules Allard, White Alum, and uh, the Baumgarten Company working on, you know, designing these lus luscious interiors. And a lot of the furniture and decorative arts were supplied for it by Lord Duveen out of New York. Not to mention the Wideners traveled the world and packed up, you know, containers of furniture and artwork to bring back to this house. Um, you know, the house went through many different iterations over the years, and this is probably the most ostentatious of them all. But um, these rooms were simplified down the road. So these tour shares went away. The table went away. It was one massive carpet. The tiger and the polar bear went away. And these little swags up here interestingly enough, were removed to simplify the room. The cartouches are still here, but the swags are now gone. And they went away somewhere around 1910. Here's two more pictures of the Victorian interiors. On the left, we have the first iteration of the reception room, very Victorian, mixed with Italian. And on the right, you have the ballroom, which also doubled as a library. You have all these um, built-in bookcases. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, you have all these built-in bookcases back here, which were later removed. Um, the only thing in this room that still is original is the ceiling. They never touched the ceiling, but everything else was torn out and redone later down the road. On the left, we have Eleanor Elkins Widener and her husband, George Dunton Widener's bedroom. And then on the right, we have the first format of the art gallery. So the art gallery used to be one massive room that was crammed with pictures. And later down the road, that back wall was blown out and they put two more art galleries on the end and then they took this one, they split it in half. So if we look at these pictures here, the one on the left is 1900 and you can see that there's no extension on the back of the building, it's just a metal port cashier and that's it. This is a current day photo of the building and you can see they added an art gallery here and one here and there's a whole complex below, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but these two galleries, uh, this one, sh the one in the middle is the Bellini Cellini, uh, which is right in the middle here. So it's over the Port Cachere. So they added the Bellini Cellini and then they put on the Van Dyke in the back, which was arguably the most impressive room in the house. Um, these were specifically designed to uh, accommodate paintings by Sir Anthony Van Dyke. And there was a massive painting, which is in the next slide, called The Feast of the Gods by Bellini and Titian. 
uh, this whole gallery here was designed just for that painting. Uh, and then in, in the back part of the complex, underneath the Van Dyke, you had a marble swimming pool. There was a two-story squash court, uh, two very large dressing rooms, a gymnasium, and a four-room solid marble Turkish bath, which is still there today. It's in rough shape, but it's still there. So there's that painting, Feast of the Gods, by Bellini and Titian. This is an interesting piece because it was painted by Bellini, and then he died. So Titian finished it. And this is considered one of the crowning jewels of the National Gallery's uh, collection in Washington, D.C. today, and certainly was considered uh, or highly regarded by the family as well. The picture on the right is of the Van Dyke Gallery. And to give you an idea of the scale of that room, that fireplace is seven and a half feet tall. And the painting on the right, which is the Marchesa Elena Grimaldi Cadiano, is 10 foot tall. So that gives you a really good idea of just how massive that room is. And pretty much everything is gone in that room except for the ceiling. I mean, the ceiling's kind of hanging on by a thread, but everything else got sold or destroyed. Um, it's the worst part of the house today, which is very unfortunate. So by the mid to late 1900s, 1910, somewhere in there, George Widener was really running the family business at this point. Peter was kind of on his way to retirement. And after George's wife, Eleanor, got thrown out of the very fabulous uh, Bellevue Stratford Hotel for smoking a cigarette, uh, he decided to build his own hotel across the street where she could smoke anywhere she wanted to. And this was Philadelphia's first Ritz-Carlton. Uh, <laughs> talk about love, right? Uh, so George and his wife, Eleanor, and their son, Harry, they went to Paris in March of 1912 to shop for the hotel, to shop for themselves, to pick up their daughter's wedding trousseau. Uh, Harry had a book that he was buying from Francis Bacon that he affectionately called Little Bacon. Uh, and they were also hiring a French chef for the hotel because you have to have a French chef, right? Unfortunately, they decided to book their tickets on the RMS Titanic when they returned home. And Harry and his father, George, both passed away along with their, uh, their valet, Edwin Keeping. Uh, Eleanor and her lady's maid, Amalia Geiger, survived. Um, George was really kind of in his prime at this point. He'd taken over all the family assets. I mean, he was an incredible businessman by himself, and he was on his way to building his own empire, if you will. And Harry was a tremendous scholar. Um, he was probably one of the preeminent book collectors in America at that time, and he had just a fantastic collection of books, including two Gutenberg Bibles. Um, and all of this was later donated to Harvard. So his mother single-handedly funded and oversaw the construction of the Harry Elkins Widener Memorial Library at Harvard, which some of you may have seen. Um, and that was one of her major, major philanthropic gifts during that time. But aside from that, I mean, she never let the loss of her husband and her eldest son um, darken the rest of her days. I mean, she went on to get remarried. She finished the home that she had started building with George in Newport called Miramar. It's still a private residence today, and it's still the largest home in Newport. And she continued to travel the world doing all kinds of crazy things, including being chased by cam uh, cannibals. Uh, you know, she just did a little bit of everything. And this is a splendid photo. Uh, we have Eleanor on the right, and then there's Horace Trumbauer in the middle, and we have George Dunton Widener, her youngest son, on the left. And this is them at Harvard when the library was being constructed. Um, you know, I, I personally have not been up to see the library yet, but it's something I'd like to do in the next year. I mean, I hear the design is absolutely incredible. Uh, and here's, here's a picture of the room today. And then there's an older picture of the library. It's just an absolutely splendid building. So once the books left, obviously the ballroom had to be redone because it was no longer a library. So they tore everything out and they put all new panels, new windows, new fireplace, everything. And like I said before, the only thing that was original is the ceiling. Uh, and they did this with many, many rooms throughout the house. Because think about it, the house was originally quite Victorian. And almost as soon as the house was built, the house was out of fashion. Uh, the, the newer French styles and Italian styles were much more in vogue at this time. So if you remember the reception room, this is when it was redone in 1910. 
So it's completely different design, heavy French, Louis XVI style. Uh, and this tapestry is called The Dream of Ronaldo, which was done in 1751 by Francois Boucher. That is also in the National Gallery of Art now. And the room looks pretty much the same today as it does in this picture, except we're missing the light fixtures, furniture, and that tapestry. But everything else is intact. Um, you know, even though they did a lot of refreshing of the home, and I suspect a lot of this had to do with the significant family loss with George and Harry passing away, um, the shadow of the Titanic did, you know, consume P.A.B. Sr. And his doctor said when he died, it was a combination of old age and heartbreak. I mean, he never truly got over that. So on November 6, 1915, Peter A.B. Widener died at Linwood Hall and he left his son, Joseph, as the sole heir. Um, and even though this was a sad time, this was really the period where Linwood entered her golden ear years, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But this photo is a very interesting photo and very um, somber, too. This is P.A.B.'s casket getting loaded into the hearse, November 1915. It's a very interesting photo to find. And a little excerpt I'd like to read you from his grandson's memoir uh, that he published in 1940 called Without Drums. He says, Grandfather lives on in my memory as a most beloved figure. He wasn't tall and he was slightly stooped. He was bald with a fringe of white hair and he had a thick white mustache. Though his figure was not imposing, he had a great personal dignity which won him deference from everyone. His air of quiet authority and of benevolence made me obey and worship him at one and the same time. These written accounts are so important to us because, you know, obviously we're never going to meet these people. We're not ever going to have an audio recording or a video recording of them. So it's so special to find these um, personal anecdotes and memories of people like P.A.B. Widener. So now we have Joseph and Ella as the new owners of Linwood Hall. And I, I promise Joseph has the ability to smile. He doesn't always look this grouchy. Um, I suspect he has this frown because he literally hated the artist who painted this portrait for him, who was Augustus John. He couldn't stand the guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, the portrait on the right of his wife is Ella Pancos Widener, and that was done by John Singer Sargent, who was a good family friend. He did quite a number of portraits for them. And for what it's worth, that's a John Singer Sargent as well, and it's still privately, uh, or it's in a private collection today. So shortly after PAB's death, the gardens, I should say the second iteration of the gardens was finished. So you, you get rid of the sunken Italianate gardens and now you have these absolutely fabulous French gardens that were designed by Jacques Grébert and his son Henri Léon Grébert did the statuary for the fountains. Um, and at this time, this is when Linwood kind of got the title of having the finest French gardens uh, for residents in the United States. <laughs> Joseph also continued to tweak the art galleries for many, many years. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling how many times these art galleries got stripped and redone. So Peter was a self taught art collector and he bought some really great pieces and he bought some really bad pieces. So after his father died, Joseph kind of weeded through the collection and kept the very best of the best. Um, and to give you an idea of the caliber of their collection, uh, right here, these are two El Grecos. Uh, this whole wall is Romney, Gainsborough, Hoffner. Um, they had works from Velasquez and uh, Raphael, Rembrandt, uh, Degas, Monet. I mean, really the finest names in the art world at that time. And they really had the best examples from each artist. Um, and Joseph was very particular about how these were all laid out. Um, this is looking into the gallery that we saw in the first art gallery picture when it was one long room. And this is looking at it when it was split into two rooms. So this is a view of the carriage house on the west side of the property. The door on the right is for where the carriages go in, the middle doors for the horses, and there's stalls on the left side, and then there's uh, some servant quarters on the top. This was turned into yet another private residence by Trumbauer on, in 1925. So Joseph and Alice's son, P.A.B. II, got married to Gertrude Peabody, and he, they needed a place to live, so Joseph got at this building and turned it into a fabulous 12,000 square foot private residence, which is still extant today. And there's a picture of it um, from the Rose Garden. Um, 
you can see the windows were completely redesigned. I mean, the building was essentially just stripped and redone from the inside out. Um, unfortunately, this is probably our biggest headache of a project today because it's a timber frame structure, not steel I-beam and concrete like the hall. So it has suffered greatly. Um, that's going to take a little bit more uh, tender, loving care to bring back to life. This is Ella Pancoast Widener again with her little dog called Dinty Moore. Uh, she always just has the most fabulous smile. She was known as a great hostess in society at that in, in her day. And uh, she was loved by everybody that writes about her. I mean, she was just an incredible woman. And she passed away at Linwood in 1929. Uh, and that left Joseph as the only Widener to live at Linwood Hall until his passing in 1943. And there's some pictures I told you he can smile. Uh, he has the ability to smile. And this is him with his family on the left right here. And that's him on the right. Um, this one, I believe, is actually at Linwood on the grounds. And these were taken in 1930s. So by the late 1920s, Joseph was finally done moving the galleries around. And every year, October through June, he would open the galleries to the public, which he was not the only person of this caliber to do this, but it was quite rare, rare that somebody with a collection of art like this and a home like this would actually open it up to the public. So it used to be you could line up at the gate, come in and view the art. And some lady attacked the mill by Rembrandt with a hat pin and he closed the galleries up for a couple of months and his wife finally got him to relent and open it up again. But you then had to come with a recommendation, but you were able to go and see it. Um, and, you know, all throughout the 1930s, there's there's all kinds of different publications talking about the the furniture collection, the art collection, and the, the finest formal French guards in America. I mean, this really was published in all sorts of magazines in the 1930s. And not only did he open it up to the public, but he would open it up to students and professors and artists from all over the world. People, you know, we're talking the 1920s and 30s when travel wasn't as prevalent as it is now, and you generally had to have a lot of money to do so. Um, people would come from all over the world to spend a couple days or even a couple weeks at Linwood just to study the art collection. Um, and Joseph and his father, Peter, had always believed that the art was should be on public display. And they'd always intended at some point in time to give it to an art museum somewhere where it could be viewed free of charge. And their final wish was finally granted with Joseph's passing on October 26, 1943. And one of my favorite quotes from Joseph, he, he had said numerous times, art belongs to those that appreciate it, others merely own it. And I think that's just a fantastic quote. So this is a picture of the dining room uh, shortly before literally everything in this room was sold. Um, so you could see there were tapestries here. There were four tapestries by Francois Boucher in this room, the Four Seasons. Those went to the National Gallery. And all the china and glasswares laid out here to be auctioned, you know, the carpets, the furniture, everything was sold. They even sold the chandeliers and the wall sconces. I mean, they really just stripped the house clean. Um, but before they did that, all the art collection was taken by the National Gallery. And this really was one of the founding basis of the National Gallery in Washington. Over 2000 works of fine art, decorative art and multitude of other things were donated. Um, it's not all in one place. You kind of have to know where to look for it. But some of the best pieces in a National Gallery came from this house. So after eh, eight years of trial times for the house, uh, a seminary tried to buy it. Then they defaulted on their loan. And then it went back to the Widener State. And then the developer tried to buy it. Same thing. Finally, uh, Faith Theological Seminary stepped in in 1952 and purchased it. And they kind of envisioned this as an Ivy League-esque Christian school, if you will. And I think they chose a good building for that. Um, and they moved here uh, from Delaware in 1952. And this is a page of the 1961 yearbook. So, you know, you can see the formal gardens really aren't, you know, cared for at this point anymore, which is totally understandable because they had 60 people on staff just to do the gardens during the Widener era. But, you know, the seminary really did care for the house. And there were a lot of passionate people that would go around fixing things and making sure the house was well maintained. Uh, and it really wasn't until the 1970s that the house started to see a downturn. 
Here's a picture of the dining room again, which we saw a couple slides ago. You know, faculty and students enjoying lunch in there. And there's an aerial photo of the house too. And you can see the, the patera is gone, it's just grass, but you know, everything else is pretty well maintained. This is a picture from the 1970s. And again, it's still in pretty good condition by this, by this time. Um, but shortly after this picture was taken, uh, things like these fountain heads, and there were several fountains up here, balusters, and then they eventually moved inside with fireplaces, marble trim, et cetera, et cetera. All that was being sold to make ends meet. Um, you know, student enrollment was declining. They were struggling to make money. And because they were struggling to make money, one of their former, um, one of their former students and board members bought their mortgage out and then mortgaged it to them himself. And unfortunately, they missed those payments too. And they had to be foreclosed upon by the current owner. And these are just a couple of views of the house in the 70s. This room is completely gone. They took that one out. And this garden is intact, except for the fountainhead. They took that. It's gone too, but everything else is still there. And now the current owner is Dr. Richard Yoon with First Korean Church of New York. So Yoon had to foreclose on them because they missed their payments. So he decided to sell it to his church, First Korean Church of New York. And he was also going to turn it into a seminary uh, and a religious school. But he went to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania twice fighting tax exemption and lost. So in turn, he just kind of boarded up the house and left it alone. But I do want to say we are extremely grateful to Dr. Yoon uh, for his willingness to work with us in the past couple of years. Um, you know, it's Linwood's been locked up for years and it's been near impossible to get into this house. And we really appreciate that he's kind of gently opened the doors for us and allow us to come in and start maintaining the house again and breathing some new life into her. And this is the house where she sits today. So, you know, the fountainheads are gone. Landscaping is just looking a little rough. You know, it could use a little work. Uh, but the house still stands here, uh, tall and proud, and she's rock solid. But not without her issues. We do have some issues. Um, so here's a view of the roof as it sits today. The entire roof is now covered in EPDM, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. Uh, it's stopping some leaks, but it's also ponding and causing other leaks. So we're currently working to fix that. And then on the right side here, you can see the gutter is filled with water and that was about eight inches deep. And that has been cleared out and that, that downspout over there, thank goodness, is now working. This was one of our small remediation projects. Uh, on the left, you can see this awful lawn from the 70s and this drop ceiling. This was turned into a quasi classroom slash rec room. And on the right, we can see the original uh, subway tile, which is just beautiful. And this was the main kitchen in the house. All the appliances are gone, but this was the main kitchen. And this room is absolutely massive. This is another one of our very, very recent projects. A um, little shout out to our number one volunteer here on the left, Ian. Uh, he's now in Alaska in the military, but he is just a powerhouse. Uh, and he did this room almost completely by himself. So this is the Bellini Cellini gallery that we looked at earlier. And it's been a dumping ground for years and years. I mean, there's just piles and piles of trash and dust everywhere. And he cleaned it out. I mean, it just looks fantastic. Here's a couple of the bedrooms upstairs. The one on the left uh, is, it was a guest bedroom. And this one's in moderately okay condition. I mean, we got some ceiling problems there, but for the most part, it's intact. And then on the right side is actually Joseph Widener's bedroom. Um, and while the floor is in really rough shape and we're missing the fireplace, uh, the tiger oak paneling is in really splendid condition. Here's two more bedrooms. The one on the left, uh, Angie actually affectionately calls the Wedgwood room. <laughs> Uh, but that was the governess's suite. And then the one on the right belonged to Eleanor Elkins Widener and her husband, George Dunton Widener. And all this broken glass was in the past couple of years from vandals coming in and just smashing glass for the joy of smashing glass, I guess. Here's two of the bathrooms. Uh, this one on the left actually belonged to a guest bedroom, believe it or not. And the one on the right belonged to Ella Pankos Widener, Joseph's wife. And I'm now very proud to say that this window, which has been a wind tunnel for years, is finally fixed. I mean, the meeting rails were shot. The glass was almost completely gone. Birds were coming in here. And now it's fixed and it's fully functional. So after decades of sitting dormant, we've taken a lot of time 
to go through this house and fix things, repair things, uh, clean it out. This room, for example, was a total disaster when we came to the house. I mean, it was just filled with garbage and broken glass. And a lot of it was really cleaning up from vandals. I mean, this house from 2020 to 2021 was just like the vandals paradise. It was open season on this house. And now that we've gotten the break-in situation under control with security cameras, we've been able to actually put some love and care back into the house by repairing windows. Uh, and here are some of the guys working on the windows right here. I think they're putting the window back in. So we replaced more than 70 panes of glass, a lot of broken meeting rails and mullions. Um, you know, we're just trying to keep the outside out. We've done extensive roof repair as well, trying to get the downspouts to work again, get the ponding water off the roof because water infiltration has been the number one enemy of this house for like 25 years. And here's two great shots. This is the ballroom as it sits today. And then this is a shot of the roof looking out towards the garden. So you could still see some of the, the fountain basins out there. But it's at this point, I'd like to invite my good friend, a colleague, and our COO, Angie Van Syak, up to talk with us a little bit about next steps. So we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you the backstory on us and Linwood Hall Preservation Foundation. So. Linwood Hall Preservation Foundation was formed in 2019. Um, we founded it with our good friend and now the vice chair of our board, Peter Oilo. And we had been, I personally, I've been dream, dreaming about saving this house since I was 11. It has occupied significant space in my head for <laughs> way too many years. And I got invited about six years ago to join an investment group that was looking to purchase the property. And that deal fell through. And I wanted to keep going. So she saw what was going on and she said, I'd love to help you out with this. Let's, let's form our own group. So Peter came in and Angie came in. This is actually around the time that Stephen Hartley came in as well. And we just started, we just started going at this and we had two investors that fell through. We had a third one that we'd actually gotten under contract and then he just walked at the last minute. Uh, and now we have our current benefactor who is now the chairman of our board. And hopefully we should be closing on the property in less than two months. And it will officially be owned by Linwood Hall Preservation Foundation. So anyway, I'll let you take it away. Yes. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> can, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so one of the ways that we want to approach this project differently is we understand the significant opportunity that Lewin Hall has. It will, quite frankly, be the largest restoration ever done, preservation restoration, preservation and restoration project done uh, in the United States. And um, we believe that we need to open the opportunities for this to be an educational opportunity, not only for knowledge and uh, research, but also in practice. And we also recognize that there is a lot of uh, need for those in the skilled trades. And so every part of this process from start to finish, we want to also inspire future generations to want to get into uh, learning more about the skilled trades, whether they're basic trades or specialty trades. And so we are, like Ed said, very thankful that our benefactor has come along and has put us in a position to help us acquire the property and get started on the other side of acquisition. Uh, it is unusual that we would be putting work and time and have, uh, you know, staff in place prior to acquisition, but that just shows the level of dedication and how much we want to say how serious we are about making this project happen. Uh, it is a broad spectrum project. Uh, it makes a significant significant impact to the local community and the Philadelphia area, but we also understand its significance in the United States and even the global interest uh, that it will uh, have as well. It is a well-known property, uh, thanks to some of the uh, videos that have been out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, it's uh, YouTube famous now. It is YouTube <laughs> famous now. But I would say that, you know, we... Linwood Hall was... Um, it was ahead of its time, even though it was built in 1899, it was advanced in its technology. 
And we've even had a few, um, one of your professors even, um, come that is saturated in classical architecture and in Europe all the time, but has come to see Linwood Hall and is fascinated and hooked just like everybody else that walks in the building because uh, there's something different than Linwood offers because it was so technologically advanced. And um, we understand that some of that from a mechanical standpoint will have to be re redone in the future, but we do want to document and research uh, and make sure that we're, uh, it's like an archaeological dig above ground. So we want to make sure that we look at what was and see how we can make it sustainable to go into the future. And so we are very intentional about how we're approaching this project. Uh, we want to, when we put firms we've been talking to already on notice that we don't want the one-stop shop. We want to incorporate a creative way and prove a different model that can really be a platform to promote preservation and classical um, the, the importance of classical architecture that we have. Uh, one of our board members who's restored his own estates have have, have likened it to the fact that we have a Fabergé egg. And the Fabergé egg does not need to be over-designed and redesigned. It's beautiful, it's art in its own form. Uh, and so we just need to bring it back to life and care for it and find ways to um, bring other future generations to come into wanting to care more about our old homes and architecture. And that is why we have, since 2019, had our tagline be, we look to the past to inspire the future. So. Absolutely. Well, questions and answers. Go ahead. How much did it cost you to buy this building out recently? That we cannot disclose until <laughs> we've actually consummated the deal. <laughs> yes. But significantly less than what Dr. Yoon advertised yes. several yes. years ago. Yes. It, it is a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But everything? Yeah, it's you own all the property. 34.85 acres of land and roughly 130,000 square feet of space with three buildings. And is the property under some sort of uh, trust or whatever so that it can't be developed and you know, built on? I'm asking these questions because I work with uh, people at the Mount Lennox, Massachusetts, and we had a lot of the same issues that you're talking about. Yeah, so believe it or not, the house has absolutely no protection on it at all right now, which is something that in the very near future, we're going to work to rectify. Next day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, and I would say to that point, the current owner, while, you know, there hasn't been a lot of activity on site to maintain some of the issues that have happened with the building, he has it, just because he does truly care about keeping the property intact uh, and does have a respect for the history of it, he he has really saved the property by not selling it to any developers. Yeah. So, you will own the building outright right. with no mortgages when this is all done. Correct. Yes. That's really right. important. Yeah. Yes. Yes. With the ability to uh, fundraise on the other side with matching funds. So. Yes. My experience is you wouldn't be able to fundraise unless you actually own the building. Correct. Exactly. Or investing in and Correct. And another actually, mortgage payment, they don't like to put that money in. Right. The actually coming up with the funds to purchase the building and own it outright was the biggest task that we had to overcome. And we are extremely uh, grateful to our benefactors, Scott and Susan Bentley, for making this dream a reality. Mm -hmm. So. So you mentioned how this building is going to be a way to inspire and a way for people to learn the trades and skills, but what do you what do you see the space becoming at the end of the day, essentially? So we want to do a cultural center. I mean, we're going to have to do events, uh, weddings, events, conferences, kind of as our bread and butter for a couple of years just to make ends meet. But um, working in the events industry myself in the past, it's very hard on a building. And we don't want this to be the long-term objective for the house. So we really want it to be a cultural center where people can come to learn about art, music, architecture, whatever, and host events that promote that as well. I mean, we're blessed to have five art galleries, which are massive in this house. So we also hope to see rotating exhibitions down the road as well for all sorts of different things. 
Yes. Yeah, so we know this will never be a true uh, traditional house museum, um, but there will be a component where we will have tours. Uh, we do want to make sure that even if we're ever able to get some of the decorative furnishings back, that most of the house what, that is accessible to the public is something you can experience and not stand behind a velvet rope that you won't be able to like do anything but look there to see what what is and uh you know there's some documentation of some of the stories out there that exist uh, for more than just the family members and if we're able to pull that all together appropriately we would love to give that full uh upstairs downstairs uh opportunity for somebody to experience almost like the american downton abbey experience so uh. Yeah. Why did the Widers sell it? Why did <clears throat> so this, I, I'm glad you asked that question because this kind of ties into the actual name of the lecture, which I totally forgot to even address, The Last American Versailles. Mm -hmm. So um, the grandson, again, dubbed this The Last American Versailles. White Marsh Hall was called The American Versailles. In 1938, it was no longer lived in and no longer cared for. Uh, so he referenced his then father's home, Joseph Widener. Um, he referenced Limit Hall as the last American Versailles, because really by 1942, 43, literally nobody in the United States was living in a house like this uh, with fully manicured gardens and a staff of 40 in-house, not to mention the rest of the estate. So, you know, living in this style was really kind of out of vogue at that point, And it really is today. I mean, if you look at the wealthy in today's society, I mean, they have multiple homes here, there, and everywhere, but very rarely does somebody have a one massive estate like this. I mean, there's so much money in the upkeep, um, and the family just didn't want to take it on anymore. It's just mm -hmm. too big. So. Sure, go ahead. Can you talk about some of the technological advances um, in terms of the design of the house that you were referencing earlier? Yeah, absolutely. So for starters, uh, this house was built, designed and built between 1897 and 1899, and it was fully electrified from the start. So <laughs> we, we are still running some of the 124-year-old elect uh, electricity in this house. And none of it is knob and tube. It's all in conduit, which is slightly safer, um, but it's still not splendid. So that's one of the first things we're going to tear into. Um, the house also has a central vacuum system which today is a luxury. Uh, back then, it was really a luxury. I mean, it's on every floor from the basement to the attic. There's a central vacuum system, although I, I'm frustrated I can't find a canister. I think it was removed, but I've searched for it many times. I can't find it. Uh, but it did have central vacuum. Um, a technological advancement for that time would be the heating system. So it was steam heat, but it was forced hot air, and it was actually on the other side of the road. Uh, for fire purposes, in case it ever exploded, it wouldn't burn down the house. So all of the heating was piped underneath Ashbourne Road, under these gardens, and then up right underneath the front door of the house into the sub-basement, and then from there, it was pumped throughout the house. I'd say probably one of the coolest technological features um, pertains to the art gallery. So the art galleries, there is a, um, a fan system, if you will, uh, above the art galleries. It's all these long, narrow metal fins. And they are hooked up to a motor and pulley system and timed. So the galleries are facing almost due north and due south. So as the sun moves throughout the day, these fins follow the pattern of the sun. So you have more or less an equal amount of light in the galleries at any given time. I mean, it's absolutely wild. And it's still there. You're welcome. Anybody else? We've got a question online. Uh, how are you planning on prioritizing the major restoration projects for you? Um, well, we have to do our master plan. And we're just around the corner from sitting down to do that. We do want to restore the house in a phase, um, uh, in a phase capacity. So, I mean, we're not just going to knock the whole thing out at once. I mean, we'll do maybe, you know, the first floor over here and then the first floor over here. And then we'll do this up, upstairs and it, it'll be a phased project. We're not going to do it all at once. Uh, and we're getting ready to have what's called a condition assessment done in the building. That's going to help inform us what areas need to be looked at now, sooner than later, uh, in terms of water infiltration, potential structural damage, et cetera, et cetera. 
In addition to that, um, one of our one of the requests from the benefactor was to also pay attention to the formal garden. So while that might not normally be the first thing that we approach, uh, we will be looking at that. And we do need to upgrade the entire system for heating and cooling. So all of that will be done in tandem um, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about um, the variety of different trades that would go on to help restore this building and wanting to use those as an educational opportunity. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the plan to do that? Sure. Um, so right now, we're talking to several different schools and trade schools about opportunities for internships to have kids come out and, and uh, intern. Um, when we actually get into the restoration of the building, we'd love to have master craftsmen either, you know, in millwork, stonework, uh, you know, come in and teach students how to do these things. I mean, we have, let me, let me just slide back a couple slides here. We have, so the, take the ballroom, for example, you have a ton of decorative plaster work in here. Now, obviously all of this would be done by a professional, uh, but the professional can teach students how to do this, how to do the gilding, how to do the molding. Um, but we also have plenty of other rooms in the house that uh, like these bedrooms where there's not so much decorative plaster work. That's something that could be used for an educational experience. The floors, we have so many wooden floors in the building that need to be looked at. There's a lot of millwork around the doors and the, the chair rail, wainscoting, um, all of that needs to be looked at as well. Um, the stone work, I mean, we have all sorts of different stones. We probably have 20 different marbles in the inside of the house. Not to mention the entire building is made out of Indiana limestone with a granite base. Um, so there's plenty of different materials to work with. Um, and we want to bring in several different schools with their instructors to help kids learn how to do those. And one of the things we appreciate um, with Notre Dame is the classical approach for the architecture because we have this beautiful piece of classical architecture and it's a house that was built for art. And we really want to make sure that while the technology of the day is something that certainly is gonna to have to be brought into perspective, we also want to appreciate the, the classical approach to uh, having those that work on the master plan appreciate that as part of the process. So we have a pretty broad, um, well, a high hill to climb with fundraising for the full project. But even if we're successful to raise what we need to in the first three to five years, we're not going to just throw money at this and make it happen in five to eight years, because we really believe this has to be something that is given back in every way from an educational perspective. And so while we will bring certain things back as soon as possible, uh, we do want to honor the process. Yes. Um, no, no, we don't. No, but we would be planning to write that, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> no and yes. <laughs> See this? No and yes. See, this is why we have Stephen. He helps us out with all this stuff. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, with so many different, the history of this home has so many different phases of different styles and traditions that it's had to do with the How would you philosophy behind deciding? That's a great question. Um, so we're actually, we're making our period of significance in the 1920s. So by the 20s, most of the major renovations were done. They were done moving rooms around and tearing them out and redoing them. Um, and that, that's really the era in, that, in which Linwood's shown the most. Um, after the 1940s, that's when it started to go downhill. So we think the 20s is our period of significance. Any more questions? I thought I saw well, All right. I've got one, one more. Oh, one more. How yeah. are you handling the documentation process of tracking um, the renovations? And, you know, it's, I mean, it's going to take years and years, like you said. So how are you handling that? Yet to be determined, um, you know, when we do find at least the right firm to work with for the master planning, some of that might come into play with 
database, but um, we are open to suggestions always. We do have to apply for our national register. And so that'll be the first massive uh, approach for documenting everything for that as well. Because I, I know that the carriage house was also included, and you mentioned that the damage is different because it's timber frame. I'm assuming. First of all, that is part of the whole plan, like right? the carriage mm -hmm. house. It is. And then the second one, what would you say is the? Because I think you're, I remember you guys saying that this was masonry and concrete was the original structure for the house, and that's why it's pretty well maintained. Yes. <laughs> what would you say uh, would you know be the one thing that would damage, or that you would try to you know work on first to prevent any damage to the actual structure mm -hmm. of Linwood Hall? Because you know, with the structure fails and everything else just kind of comes afterwards. Water, always water. The roof and the, the internal, internal gutters. gutters. Yeah, we have internal downspouts mm -hmm. which are just wreaking havoc on the building <laughs> right now. Um, we're trying to kind of sort of band-aid it right now till we actually own it, but that would be number one, getting the water stopped and then drying the building out. And, and the lodge is also something we're gonna focus on sooner than later because uh, it's still able to be heated, cooled and have water. Uh, we can turn, that's a little more turnkey from a function system, um, but we do have some structural issues because of the water damage did impact the timber framing more. So it is something that we will be looking at sooner than later as well. I'm um, sorry, one last question. Uh, <laughs> so once you get placed on the historic register, is the trust looking to place um, get essentially like historic preservation tax credits from the house in order to fund, or is that not something that's applicable in this case? Um, given that we're a 501c3 nonprofit, I don't think that would be applicable. Um, we, we are looking to do a conservation easement down the road, but not, I don't think we have anything to do with tax credits now. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on how we do collaborative partnership, if that would make sense. You know, if we have a for-profit partnership in the future, it's not the intention at this point, but you know, you never know. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time today. We really appreciate you being here. And I have to say, we're very honored to be at Notre Dame and everything Absolutely. we've been able to observe in the studios is you guys are just art in motion. So yeah. we appreciate it. And once again, huge thank you to Steve for making all of this happen. Yes. And uh, he's incredible, guys. He's incredible. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Um, and then you'll be around for a little bit longer today if you have any other questions, but uh, not uh, enjoy your evening. <laughs>